Hi, my name is Dawn Davies. I am the head buyer for the Whiskey Exchange and I am so, so happy to be here today because um, I have become more and more and more of a fan of American whiskey. And I'm using the word American whiskey because I think a lot of us just think bourbon. Um, and I think, you know, we have some amazing bourbons here tonight, but it's not just about bourbon. There are some incredible whiskies out there being made in America today. And I think we're super lucky to have four people from four different distilleries here tonight that for me are kind of what I would describe as the new wave of American whiskies. Uh, and I think they're doing some incredible things and you're gonna taste, uh, well, six very, very different products. Of course, a vodka, which we totally, totally different, but you know, five very, very different uh, whiskies tonight that I hopefully will kind of give you an idea why I just think, I think American whiskey is really, really an exciting category right now. And we're really, really lucky to have here tonight, and I'll introduce you guys as I go, Autumn um, from Jet for Creed. Um, uh, hi, Autumn. Hey, nice to meet everybody. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Colby from Frey Ranch, which is all the way over in Nevada, so the other side of the country. Hi, everybody. And we have Jay from New Riff, which we're back over into Kentucky. Hello, thanks for having me, Don. Thank you. And last but definitely not least, from where I grew up in the amazing state of Maryland, Brian from Sagamore. Thank you for having me. No, thank you guys. Um, and you know, the first question I kind of want to throw out is, and you know, I think what I want to kind of touch on tonight, and guys, please, please ask questions because we're not going to really go into too much kind of what is a bourbon, what isn't, but we'll we'll touch on it as we go through. So if there are any questions that you have, either throw them up in the Facebook comments and Dave will all ping them up in. Um, or, uh, so I've been told that there's no vodka in this tasting, so I'm, I'm one tasting behind myself today. <laughs> Sorry, guys. The vodka is delicious from Jets of Creed, by the way. Um, but yeah, if you want to ask anything from Facebook, please feed that in. Or if you want to ask in the chat, just throw up any questions. So if you suddenly say, actually, what makes bourbon bourbon? Ask. Um, so one thing I want to touch on, and Autumn, I'm, I'm going to ask you first, you know, if you think about what makes American whiskey American whiskey now, what, what is that? I think American whiskey, we, we've got rules that we have to follow, but I think innovation is really what's cool that's coming out of a lot of the craft distilleries that are growing up around the country. Uh, I mean, more and more craft distilleries are coming out, and I think everybody who's on this tasting today is all from a, a would call themselves craft. Uh, so that's what I think is really cool that's coming out of America, because even though we all have to follow very similar rules, we all have this different way of doing things and we come up with something new and fantastic that just sets our products apart from all the other ones out there. Uh, like for us, it's our corn that we use. We grow our own heirloom varietal of corn called Bloody Butcher. It's this heirloom varietal that's been in use since 1845. Uh, we've been growing it for 10 years now. It's the only corn that we use for our products. Uh, it's this red color, which I'll throw a picture up here later so that you guys can see it. Uh, on the Zoom and on Facebook. Um, but it's, it's not just us. I mean, everybody here on the panel has done something unique that makes, that stand, makes their products stand out. And I think that's what's really cool about American whiskey. And I think you're absolutely right. It's that what's, what's different. And, you know, like you're, you're classic Kentucky, but Colby, you know, you're, you're the other side of the country. What, why, what makes you still American, but still individual? Yeah, so um, we're in Nevada, which is actually the driest state in the United States. Um, but where we are, we have an abundance of water and agriculture. So we're what, what's called the oasis in Nevada. And we get Sierra snowmelt from both sides of Lake Tahoe. So there's a lot of agriculture here. And so my family's been farming here since 1854. And Nevada didn't become a state until 1864. And so what sets us apart is we grow all of our grains here in a sustainable way that encourages quality for distilling purposes. And so we're really fortunate to be here. We grow, um, we've experimented with all kinds of different varieties of grain, um, also different irrigation techniques, different fertilizer management, planting dates, you know, and then, um, and so it really gets that kind of idea of like in the wine world, it's called an estate winery. 
but we don't call ourselves an estate distillery because in the distilling world, estate doesn't mean the same thing. And so um, we're farmers and distillers and they're both important because by growing our own grains, we encourage quality and with starting off with better inputs, you end up with better outputs. And so by growing it ourselves, we, we ensure that we're growing it for quality and, and specifically for quality for distilling purposes, which often is the opposite of what we do if we we're just selling grain on the open market, like to the cattle companies or, or something else, the other uses of grain. And so by growing it ourselves is the, really the only way that we can ensure that we're getting what we want, you know, grown in the way that we want it. There's no bad pesticides applied, you know, all that kind of stuff. And so, um, you know, we're really fortunate to, to be able to grow it ourselves. And yeah, I'm never worried about emailing Colby at crazy hours because I know he's going to be up like on a tractor somewhere. So, <laughs> and, and Jay, you know, we, we, we behind you, I think, as you said, it's like one of the points of innovation for you guys. But, you know, what for you make you kind of unique and, and special? Oh. I, 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 we, we struggled a little bit at, at times with that as we came up. So on the back of our bottles, we're called New Riff. And it means that we are a new riff on an old tradition, like a guitar riff or a jazz riff. Someone is playing a riff on the tradition. So we, we learned the tradition, which for us is Kentucky sour mash whiskey making. We inhaled that, we learned it, but we want to do a riff on it. And at, at times I thought, you know, as we're a year, two years into this, I thought, are we really doing something that is so revolutionary? We run uh, whiskey through a copper column beer still. You can see it in the picture behind me, the tall still here. We use a doubler. Uh, we make, it's all copper. We make uh, sour mash. So does most other people in, in most other distilleries in Kentucky. We're not reinventing the wheel here. Are, what, what kind of a riff are we doing? And we, we sort of matured into that uh, name and that, that slogan to continue to explore and continue to make these new riffs. So uh, our, our, our flagship whiskey, which I don't think we're, we're tasting today, but our flagship whiskeys are bottled in bond uh, strictly. We don't make any whiskey other than bottled in bond. We don't make a 90 proof or an 80 proof one year old or something like that. Everything is, is bottled in bond, except I note, and we'll come back to these later, our single barrels are barrel proof and they say they could not be bottled in bond. So, um, I realized that that in itself was a new riff because we were bottling these expressly without chill filtration. Hardly a concept that we invented. We, we actually learned it from Springbank there in Campbellton, uh, one of my sort of North Star that I pegged my work at New Riff to. Uh, so it's unchill filtered. Well, it turns out the one thing that the federal regulations for bottled in bond, which by the way is since 1897, the world's highest quality standard for, for a brown spirit, higher than the standards in Scotland and cognac and great spirits regions like that. Uh, the one thing the federal government allows you to do, they admit in the regulation that uh, you are allowed to chill filter. They, they call it chill proofing the whiskey. And they admit that that will change the whiskey. That's the only thing you can do aside from adding water to change a bottled and bond whiskey from its native state in the barrel. And I realized when we don't even do that, and it is bottled and bond without chill filtration, we are endeavoring to raise uh, the world's highest quality standard to, to an even higher level by, by taking away the one thing expressly not chill filtering it, which we would be allowed to do. Um, that was in its own way, a very small new riff. Uh, as years go by, the riffs get heavier and heavier and heavier and <laughs> We have many riffs coming down the pike, uh, as you'll see in, in, in the future. Yes, some of which we'll get to uh, the UK. Small and amounts of them, but-, but Lots uh, of them, Jay, lots of them. <laughs> uh, I think, could you just be really, um, give a very, very short definition of what Bottle and Bond is, just in case anyone doesn't know? Sure, it, it's a good thing to know about American uh, whiskeys. It can apply to many different American spirits. There are bottled and bond rums, bottled and bond apple brandies, but primarily it's a whiskey designation. It comes out of the Bottled and Bond Act of 1897. It was, at least in America, our first uh, quality and consumer protection act. The, the kind of thing that, that codified and put some, some standards around whiskey that were not there before, when whiskey could be almost any damn thing you wanted to blend up. So. Uh, bottled and bond has a, a number of quality requirements. It has to be four years old. It has to come from one season. That's the spring or the fall season of distillation. It has to come from uh, the same distiller 
Uh, and if, if bottled somewhere else, you have to disclose that. It's, it essentially ensures a great deal of transparency through to the consumer. My favorite part is it's required to be 100 proof, not 80 proof, not 90 proof, not at least 100 proof, 100 proof. It's the one brown spirits quality standard that insists on, on strong water, insists, insists on, on uh, good high proof in your spirit. We, d we don't water it down to 40% like you do there in Scotland. You know, bottled and bond is good, strong stuff. And it also forbids the addition of any uh, uh, additives. We cannot add caramel color, but we also could not add a flavoring. There are, you know, apple flavored bourbons, black cherry flavored bourbons. Those things are mutual, they're fine product. I'm not knocking them, but they are mutually exclusive against bottled and bond. So it, it was a, a way to put a, you know, a, a line in the sand and say, we will not cross this. We are meaning hard on our sleeve. Here is our distillery number, DSPKY20016. And if, if we really mean it, that quality is, is job one at New Riff, how can we not bottle everything we do as, as bottled and bond? And so that's what we do. Thank you, perfect. And, and Brian, I'm gonna hit over to you now because you know, Maryland, who'd have thunk? But actually you have a long history of distilling up in that kind of part of, part of the world, be it rum, be it beer, whatever. Yeah, we do. Um, it's interesting. I don't think people, people often think of American whiskey, think of Maryland. Um, but, you know, we have a rich history of distilling, like you said, that goes back to 15, 1600s. At the time, it was rum. Um, but like many things, you know, uh, wars or taxes and tariffs and governments get involved. And, and it's kind of interesting. Some things haven't changed too much to this day. And, uh, you know, we really kind of saw uh, right around 1733, when we got hit with the Molasses Tax Act, um, we switched from making rum to solely making whiskey. And we grew a tremendous amount of tobacco here in Maryland and used rye grain as a cover crop and had a lot of folks here in Maryland coming through uh, Baltimore, you know, second largest site for immigration next to Ellis Island. So we had a lot of folks from Poland, Scotland, Ireland, Germany, who knew how to distill grain based type products. And, you know, we didn't want to pay taxes and tariffs naturally. and so. We just switched over to grain-based type products and it was just strictly rye whiskey from then on and it continued to emerge uh, right up. We kept distilling even right through prohibition. One of the reasons Maryland's called the free state, you know, we had 44 distilleries in Maryland in 1910, 21 in downtown Baltimore, and then uh, eventually switched over to ethanol production to help support World War II and, uh, you know, really didn't have much of uh, a distilling history after that the last distillery closing its doors in 1982 and selling that name off to uh, Heaven Hill, and that's Pikesville Rye. But yet kind of this identity of Maryland style rye uh, could live on for decades without actually anybody in Maryland doing it. We saw that as a great opportunity for, in, for, at Sagamore. And that's, I mean, super interesting, but I, I'd love to come back to kind of rye and, and I think you, you and Jay talking about rye and the, the problems with it, because I think I only just discovered how hard it is to distill. So I'm sure like most people don't realize, but Autumn, I think everyone's probably about ready for a wee dram, as we would say in Scotland, Jay. <laughs> uh, and Autumn, I, I'd love you to talk us through the Jet the Creed and definitely show the picture of the bloody butcher corn because it's insane. Yes, so here. Okay, so that is actually what the Bloody Butcher corn looks like. It's an heirloom uh, corn that we grow ourselves. Uh, our bourbon is a four grain mash bill. So it's 70% of that Bloody Butcher corn, 15% malted rye, 10% malted wheat, and 5% malted barley. Uh, it has been aged for a minimum of two years in a char three oak barrel that's also been toasted and we think that the 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 corn just gives off this absolutely beautiful nutty flavor that we just don't get from other corns that we've tried before and you almost get this black cherry orange sickle I got a hint of lavender in there it's just it's this beautiful floral notes mm -hmm. that come through that you wouldn't necessarily expect out of bourbon you know, I mean, bourbon, you think oak, vanilla, you don't think floral, <laughs> you don't think spring. 
<laughs> I, I do like one of my tells for American whiskey as a, a general is I always get some sort of cherry wood or linseed oil in anything that I it's my kind of tell. Uh, but actually, can you talk a little bit about the you know the one thing that makes American whiskey American is this idea of the mash bill and and the guys as we go through will talk about their own mash bills. But can you kind of maybe give a little bit of a kind of what is a mash bill? You know, why does American whiskey do use mash bills? Uh, so the mash bill is almost like the just the the grain content, the recipe for the bourbon. Um, it's basically it boils down to when you cook to the spirit. So in the cooking process, which is the first thing you do after you mill the grains, um, that's where you'll add all of the grains into the cooker. And then from there, you'll move on to fermentation and then to distillation. Uh, that's kind of where the mash bill comes from, is from that cooking phase. And I mean, I think with, with this, I mean, you just get that, you're, you're right, you, we were talking about this sort of banana note on it. And it's really just, the, I mean, it's just such, and, and I, what it, guys, I really want you to kind of really look at how different all these whiskeys are as we go through this, because I think they're so individual, they're so unique. And, and the one thing uh, Autumn hasn't talked about is actually how sustainable they are and how in the distillery, they're always trying to source local and things. And I, if you could just maybe touch on that, that'd be fabulous. Yeah, so we try to source as local as possible. Uh, all of our corn is grown within a few miles of the distillery. We have 1,200 acres here in Shelby County that we grow all of our corn on. So 10 minutes from the distillery is the longest drive you have to go get the corn. Um, all of our flavored products, like we're not really talking about the vodkas in this session, but for our vodkas, we have a flavored vodka line and all of those flavors are done naturally with real ingredients, as many as local as we can. Like for the honey vodka, which you can get on the Whiskey Exchange website right it's now. It's amazing, <laughs> it's amazing. I don't like vodka, I love this. <laughs> but some of the honey that we use for that honey vodka was uh, produced here on site my brother is a beekeeper so some of his honey goes into our honey vodka so it just as much as we can we try to be sustainable we like to say that we're ground to glass because everything the entire process happens here on site uh, we grow the corn we mill it here we distill it here we age it here we bottle it here we sell it here everything's done here on site which, which is amazing. And I think, uh, you know, a lot of us are, are becoming more and more aware of what we're drinking. I think we really want to know where everything comes from. And I think a lot of times when we're even when we're looking at Scotch whiskey or, or bourbons, I don't think anyone's really been, they talk about, okay, it's a percentage of corn, rye, malted barley, blah, blah, blah. But no one actually is talking about where it's from. And actually Colby, I'm going to bring you in here to have a little taste of the Frey Ranch because you know, the one thing you are is you're a farmer. <laughs> we talked about it earlier. Um, and, and if there's any transparency, like, like with autumn, you know, you're it. The buck stops with you from like grain to glass, as it were. Yeah. <clears throat> so it's, it's the same idea. So we grow 100% of the grains and our bourbon is a four grain. So it's wheat, rye, barley, and corn. We even malt our own barley for the, the barley percentage right here on the farm. We have a malt house. We've also malted all the grains, wheat, rye, and barley, and corn. Um, but the bourbon that you guys are trying today is four grain. And I get a little bit of the spiciness from the rye, a little bit of the, it's almost like a creamy mouthfeel from the wheat, you know, and it's a little bit of sweetness from the corn. And we really wanted that four grain because we wanted to showcase all four grains that we grow you know, ourselves right here on the farm. And, and that's really how the distillery became a thing is my, my wife and I, I had always wanted to be a farmer since I was a little boy. I wanted to take over the family farm. But in the meantime, we were always selling grains on the open market. We never really got to see a final product. It was almost like we're just a middleman and we never got to experience the final product or let other people experience e it either. And so um, Whiskey has always been my passion and we thought what better way to showcase our, our grains than to actually make it into whiskey and have a final product that we can be proud of and, and really share with the world. That's why it's, it's, a, it's a thrill to me to be in the UK and, and uh, let people try it there. You know, that's like the most exciting thing for me. And uh, so the whiskey is an average of five years old. It's 4.7 to 5.3 years uh, barrels blended together. Um, and uh, yeah, we're really all 53 gallon full-size whiskey barrels. 
And so from the beginning, we said that we want to ensure that we get the best quality. We don't care if it costs a little bit more money or takes a little bit more time. We're, we're all quality focused. And so it really starts in the field. And, and often when we're, in, when we're improving the grains for distilling purposes, the quality, it almost always lowers our quantity. And that's okay because we're growing it ourselves and we can sacrifice that qu quantity to get better quality. But um, you know, and the only only way to do that is to grow it ourselves, and so it's really a big part of us. We live right here on the farm. The distillery is right here on the farm, and so we're literally just surrounded by all of the fields. And so it's it's just a lifestyle for us, not only um, you know just a business. And it's funny because uh, we talked to Don earlier, and we had a short break until this one. And I actually went and bought a guy delivered a new tractor to me, and I just bought a new tractor in the last. 30 minutes. So it's perfect. Yeah. You heard it here first. <laughs> got a new John Deere tractor. I'm really excited for it. I haven't even sat in it yet because I came right, I just paid the guy and came right back in here. So I'm kind of excited when we're done. <laughs> That's it. We're going to see Colby shooting out and <laughs> driving. You know, I love that. I love that image in my head that, you know, we've got Colby, who's the distiller, who's literally about to go jump on a tractor after this conversation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Absolutely brilliant. And, you know, I think actually I'd like to before, and you know, if we're tasting this one, I mean, I just think what I love about this is I think that kind of that four bill, that four mash bill uh, is really, really interesting because I think you're right, you get a little bit of everything. So corn gives you that sweetness, that roundness, that ripeness, almost that fruitiness. That rye, which we'll talk about with, with Brian and Jay in just a second, gives you that beautiful spice. You know, you said that wheat gives you that kind of texture, that creaminess. And you know, it's it's just so lovely. You just get this really kind of balanced um, whiskey from it, I think. I, I just, I really love this. this. This for me is the Balveni of bourbons, if we're talking scotch. You know, it's got that round, honeyed kind of character, that just kind of really easy drinking kind of character, which I just absolutely love. So this is really, really delicious. And actually, Jay, uh, I think we'll, we'll just kind of have a bit of a conversation before we taste the next two, but Jay and Brian, um, I'd love for you to both talk about the kind of, the problems you've had around distilling rye, because uh, I was saying to the guys earlier, for me, rye is the Pinot Noir of the whiskey world. It's fickle, it's a bit of a bastard, but my God, it's great in the palate, you know, like. <laughs> so Jay, if I hit you first, then Brian afterwards, because you're both kind of heavy rye producers, that'd be amazing. Sure, sure. Well, um, we, uh, we were devoted to rye at New Riff from the early days. We knew we would make plenty of rye whiskey. We also have, uh, we were talking about grain bills earlier. Our bourbon has a high rye mash bill. It's 30% uh, rye in the bourbon mash bill. And so uh, this neat side note, a fact about, uh, about New Riff, between making uh, a rye whiskey of 95% rye and 5% malted rye, and a bourbon of 30% rye, we actually go through about 20% more rye grain on an annual basis than we do uh, corn, which I'm pretty sure has never happened in, in Kentucky distilling history because all those old master distillers hated making rye. They made as little of it as they could. They made it with as small a rye content as they could, often the, the, the legal minimum of 51%. And it, it wasn't a, an emphasis the way uh, for them and, and uh, the way bourbon was. And, and because it's such a, as you put it, a bastard in, in the production plant, it is gummy in the fermenter. Uh, if you are visiting New Riff, you will probably see at least two fermenters, three fermenters full of rye. And if you dip your fingers in those and feel it, it feels oily, it feels kind of slimy. Uh, it gums up in the still. Uh, we just had a, a distillation on Friday night that, uh, man, we barely made it. We had to run the stills. Our, our distillers were there until about 2.30 in the morning, inching the rye through this still. And then finally, the next day on Saturday, we could clean the still and give, give the still a, a nice bubble bath. But man, it's so hard to distill. Much more so when you're making a rye like we do with 95% rye. We were taught how to make this recipe that came out of uh, famously out of the Indiana distillery, which to us is kind of a local distillery, by the way. Uh, we are in Newport, Kentucky. That's in the very, very far north of Kentucky, right across the river from Cincinnati, Ohio. Well, also in greater Cincinnati is Lawrenceburg, Indiana, where this distillery uh, is located. And they set the world on its ear with the 95% rye recipe starting from about 2004 when it 
kind of burst out onto the world. It's a long story, I won't bore you. We were trained in how to make that rye by the master distiller that invented it. And so uh, we, we put a riff on it by putting in 5% malted rye as opposed to malted barley. Um, it is uh, difficult to make, uh, but again, we have some, maybe some tricks up our sleeves that the old time distillers didn't have uh, with the use of some modern enzymatic uh, additives and things like that. So Matt has a great, a great question. Bourbon has a minimum age, two years, four years of bottle and bond. Does rye have a minimum age also? Good question. Um, well, bourbon has a minimum age, two years, in order to be a straight whiskey. And rye whiskey, to be straight, also has to be aged two years. A straight whiskey has to be two. It has to be four to be bottled and bond. And it also has to be four years old if you don't put an age statement on it. If you see a, a bottle of American whiskey with no age statement, uh, they are either fibbing or it's four years old. Um, bourbon actually beyond that does not have an age statement. You can age bourbon. It has to be stored. This is the language stored in new charred oak containers, which is to say barrels. And it can be stored for two years and say straight. It can be stored for one year and just be called bourbon whiskey. It could be stored for six months. Uh, I know of one uh, cheeky distiller somewhere. I don't remember where he is, but he ages the whiskey for about five minutes and puts a label of bourbon on it. And it's essentially a white unaged whiskey, but it's bourbon. Legally, he documents that, yes, he put it in a new charred oak barrel every time. So um, two years old is the common uh, aging requirement in order to be straight. And the vast majority of, of bourbon, certainly the ones from Kentucky are mostly straight bourbon whiskeys. And I think the one thing, and we'll touch on it a bit later, the one thing that's super important here is that when you age something, it's not just about that oak influence. It's about time. It's about oxygen oxidizing alcohols, which for me is as important as the process of pulling in the flavors. So, you know, just keep that in mind. And we'll talk a little bit about the, the use of barrels in American whiskey in a little bit. Um, Brian, you know, rye, it's your modus operandi. <laughs> <laughs> it <Wow>. is. <laughs> you know, um, uh, for us, again, it kind of goes back to that, that history in Maryland, you know, being historically known for distilling rye. So we're laser focused on that one particular product that that is all we make is, is rye whiskey. Um, we were we we're very fortunate enough to also work with uh, the same folks, the good folks over at New Riff, um, Mr. Larry Ebersole, who was the master distiller at LDI, and I kind of call the godfather of rye whiskey. So he definitely helped but it is a tricky um, distillation for sure that, you know, a, a good example kind of the other day we came in and um, typically the, the, the fermentation tank, we have 6,500 gallon fermentation tanks and, and we usually are about 18 inches or so from the top of the fermentation when we, when we fill up our tanks. And uh, usually we'll get about four or five inches of, of foam on top. It, ten, it can be very foamy. And just the other day, you walk in and we had one that basically almost foams completely over. And, and the, we don't necessarily know why. It just, uh, it had a mind of its own. And, and uh, you know, as uh, Jay was saying too, it can, it can be very gummy on the, on the cook. Um, and so for us, what we've really learned, especially from distilling rye, is the worst thing we can do is, is, is actually stop distilling. Um, because starting up is really, really tough. And what we do is we distill two different mash bills of, of, of straight rye whiskey. And just like bourbon, you know, you have to be at least 51% corn to be a bourbon. Well, to be a rye, we have to be at least 51% rye. And we distill two, um, one that's 95% rye, 5% malted barley. And then we distill one we call our barely legal rye or a low rye. That's 52% rye, 44% corn, 5% malted barley. And if we have to shut down for a clean or a holiday, we'll always start with that 52% rye because the corn just makes it easier on us. But once we get going again, it, it is, you really just kind of don't want to stop because it's, it, it's really tough to get started again. It's so finicky. And so we just kind of learned that, you know, we work seven days a week. It's just much easier, believe it or not. And so and then constantly starting and stopping. And so that's kind of what Rise taught us is you're going to work seven days a week because it's just a little bit easier than starting and stopping. And if you had to stop, you'll start with the low Rye and, and kind of go from there. And then 
you know, on the other end too, which is always interesting is kind of dealing with what we call the stillage, right? At the, the very end, what do we do with all this spent grain at the end? And since we have very little corn, we find that there's not as many farmers interested in it. And so it also finds uh, a little tricky to find a home for that. Luckily, we've built out a, a relationship with a great local farmer who does need it and has a great use for it. But it took us a little while to find the right person that uh, when we said, oh, you know, we're, we have a lot of water in it. And uh, those who are used to working with beer and, and then uh, it's, it's rye and, and not every, not every uh, you know, cow or pig loves rye. That's what we learned. Why? They're so picky. I mean, I thought pigs they did anything. <laughs> That's right. I'm, actually, I'm just, before we sort of do the tasting on new riff, uh, I, one thing, and I'll throw this back to you, Autumn, if that's okay. We talk a lot about sour mash, and, and actually, it's a question for all of you. I was trying to find out if anyone in America didn't use sour mash as a, <laughs> in, their, in their whiskeys. I'm super interested if anyone doesn't. Um, but can you sort of describe that process of sour mash autumn and just kind of so people understand it? Because it is very specific to America. It is very specific. And I'll probably throw this question back onto uh, some of my other guys that are here on the call with me because we don't actually use a sour mash process. Oh my God, why did I not yeah, know We this are sweet mash. <laughs> we actually do a sweet mash. Uh, so we don't we don't hold anything back from the previous and then throw it into the, the new batch. So I'll, I'll have to throw that question onto the other guys. That's awesome. I wouldn't be able to answer oh, that very well. That. So sweet mash, what, what would that, that's literally just the normal fermentations if you were scotch whiskey. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, it's just, you know, instead of like in sour mash, you'd hold back a little bit yeah. from the previous distillation and throw it into the new distillation, whereas we just, it's new distillation every Nothing time. at all. Oh my goodness, yeah. why did I not know? So you've answered the second part of my question, which is, <laughs> I'm now gonna store that away. Uh, Colby, <laughs> now you're gonna be like, I've never used a sour mash in my life. Like, all right. <laughs> All, all of our whiskeys are, are sour mash. And so, yeah, we take a little bit of our already distilled liquid and we put it into the mash cooker when we're cooking into the mash. And what it does is the liquid is really acidic and it lowers the pH in the next batch, which allows the yeast to kind of work better, but it also gives it this sour. Um, if you stick your finger in our tanks, right, when it's done fermenting, it almost tastes like a sour beer, you know, versus a, a, a normal beer. And, um, and then we also take a little bit of our, our newest fermentation tank and we also run seven days a week just because it, it allows us to be really consistent in each batch and so um, we take a little bit of our already distilled um, our, our tank that's already distilling really like vigorously and we pump it into the next tank right when we're pumping in the mash and so it, it just gives it that little bit of starter almost like a sour bread type starter you know and it's, it's a, a great way to be consistent from batch to batch but also I really think it it has a lot to do all of our tanks are open air and you know as you do that over over a long period of time I really think it adds a lot of um, you know unique flavors to your whiskeys. Yeah and actually there's a really great question here George I'm gonna also answer this because I freaking love cheese um, so um, for me with a bourbon a hard cheese like Jay says something like a howdah or a, a, a cheddar, anything that's got a little bit of age, because what you want is when cheese ages, it's hard cheese, you get these beautiful sugar crystals that almost have this caramelization. And so, you know, that works super well with bourbons. For me with rye, a blue cheese, something spicy that's gonna work with those spices in, in a blue cheese, because you're gonna have that in a Stilton or in a Roquefort or anything like that. And also you're gonna have a little bit of that acidity that's gonna really cut through the creaminess of the cheese. So cheese is probably the second passion of my life after booze, um, just in case anyone was wondering there why well, I got a little excited by that question. Anyone else want to answer what cheeses they think? Goat cheese, that's kind of interesting. Um, <laughs> or anyone want to add to the sour mash um, point? Uh, I'll, I'll chime in on sour mash. We are uh, very much a, a sour mash distillery at New Riff. In fact, every day, <clears throat> the first thing our distillers do, we join hands, and say a prayer for all those poor benighted souls making sweet mash in Kentucky. They're doing it wrong, we think. No, they're, they're not. That's a, a nice way to make a whiskey too. But it, it, we, we pursued sour mash, partly being taught by uh, our, our teacher, our sensei, that in his experience, that always made better whiskey. 
and we found that to be true when on the rare occasions we have had to make a sweet mash. For example, small side note, what was the first whiskey we ever made at New Rip? When we turned the stills on for the first time, we had no, no back set. I'll tell you what that is in a second. Back set to put in, in the bourbon. We had never distilled before. So we made a corn whiskey as sort of a sacrificial victim to get its, its back set in order to sour mash bourbon. So we don't sour mash, uh, don't, don't sweet mash anything uh, for New Riff and it's all sour mash. It is, a, another reason we pursued that is we viewed that as Kentucky's or one of Kentucky's and specifically Kentucky, unique contributions to the world of whiskey. Um, Brian can please chime in later, but I don't think in the East Coast traditions of whiskey making, which is essentially rye whiskey from places like Maryland and the Monongahela Valley in uh, Pennsylvania and in New York. In New York, in those days, there it was much more a sweet mash slash pot still tradition, and it's it's sour mash that is more uniquely Kentucky's contribution to the way of making whiskey in the world. We're not saying it's better than the way they do it in Scotland. We do not stand on our pot stills and say. Pot stills are better because that's how they do it in cognac or someplace like that. So we pursue sour mash out of a sense of Kentucky's you know, tradition in how we make whiskey. We want to be, however, a new riff on that old tradition. And so we are, are strictly sour mash. If uh, just to point out a technical question of how it's made, if people don't know, uh, our column still like this, you see this tall copper column still right here. It's 18 inches in diameter. Uh, that process is the grain as well as the liquid. It's different than the column coffee style stills that they run in Scotland or Ireland. Uh, we, we digest the entire beer. The grain also, it's distilled on the grain, goes through that. And so coming out the bottom of the still is the, the, the leftover of that after all the alcohol has been taken out. It's called stillage. And it goes in a tank and we pull back, we set back. And so the old time Kentucky distillers called that back set because it's been set back, so we call it back set. Back set is held back to go into the next uh, cook, the next uh, batch or the next cooking uh, of, the, of the grains. And so it uh, uh, does a number of things, including putting a little bit more solid matter uh, as opposed to just adding water. It uh, adjusts the pH a little bit. It does add a little bit of uh, beneficial minerals and nutrients and things like that for the yeast. And uh, it also saves some energy because we are adding boiling hot back set back into uh, the, the product. It saves on our water usage because we're reusing a little bit of that liquid. But at the end of the day, and Master Larry told us this too, at some point, even our great master distiller that taught us so much didn't know all the reasons why Sour Mash made better whiskey. At some point he threw up his hands and said, it just makes it better. Uh, we did a small experiment, which I hesitate Dawn, to mention here because yeah. I don't know when we'll be able to get you any. We don't have any more coming for several years, but it was a project called Backsetter and it involved, um, God, I shouldn't even tell you this. It involved it, 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 uh, the addition- finding all these whiskeys from me and I'm now really upset. <laughs> it, it, it involved the addition of a backset that was collected from a distillation of peated malted barley. And it made, it made the bourbon and the rye that we did it to gave them a character that was indeed peaty. But it, it was not, it's not fair to call it peated bourbon. When we make a weeded bourbon, what do we do? We add wheat grain to the bourbon. If, uh, if, if uh, Colby makes a four grain bourbon, he adds four grains to the bourbon. If you make peated bourbon, you add grains of peated barley to the mash. We added nary a grain of peated malted barley to those back setters, only the back set, and yet they profoundly flavored the whiskey with this peaty flavor. Uh, it's a sort of a, a black magic that allowed it to happen. And it was, it was not an accident, but it wasn't something that we did thinking, aha, four years from now, we'll release on the world and disappoint our, our British importers with their inability to get this rare peated that we just did it because that's what you do in a sour mash distillery. A little bit of the last match goes into the next one. And I distinctly remember the language, which being that Whiskey Exchange is a family channel, I won't say exactly <laughs> what they said, but it's, it was something to the effect of, screw it, put it in. And we tried it out and lo and behold, it made a really cool product. So uh, sour mash manifestly has been proven to, to change the flavor of the whiskey and we're sticking to it. God love you, Autumn. <laughs> <laughs> Autumn's like, right. 
<laughs> it's going to be a fight. Brian, I'm going to direct this question to you because I think it's a really interesting question that's come through on Facebook. Um, so curious what the speaker's thoughts are on whether to include the husk of the rye or not. In brackets, a lot of linion there, if I remember right, presumably a lot of flavor, but hard in practice. Ooh, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, you know, for us, I think one of the things that goes, that, that we don't do that, you know, but you know, and that, that I'm just, my wheels, you got me thinking now and my wheels, yeah. spinning, right? And so, but I think one of the things that, that we've learned, especially, you know, once you start um, kind of uh, growing your own grain is one of the most important things you can do is actually cleaning the grain. And, you know, you want the grain to be incredibly clean when it shows up. Um, you really want to make sure you get access to the best starches as possible. And you want it to be as efficient as possible. And, you know, uh, grain that's dirty or um, kind of not as clean can certainly have some effects on your organoleptic evaluations. And it can, you know, not that there's anything wrong with uh, earthy and, and type whiskeys, but rye tends to be a little grassy and earthy as it's. Um, and so for the palate for us, we like to really just have the cleanest, uh, Bursetto rye possible and that's what we kind of run with and that's kind of our approach for it. So you wouldn't they say it's about the kind of really getting that almost a clear wart so the, any linion you're going to get I guess is coming from oak. Yep. Any textural qualities. Um, talking of oak, I love a bit of oak. Um, so oak is kind of before we taste the new riff um, just for autumn and, and, and Colby um, you know, oak so important and you're both making bourbons and there are laws around bourbons and actually I'm going to come back to Brian at the end because I didn't realize Brian did so many barrel finishes so I'm super interested to kind of go and talk to you about when we talk about Sagamore at the end. Um, you know for you oak that American oak what does that give does is that as much a part of bourbon and you know using the, the charring as opposed to the toasting which is, is the modus operandi over in um, Scotland, unless you're Ardbeg and you do the crocodile one, um, the crocodile Ardbeg, I can't remember what that was called. Uh, Autumn, you know, are you sourcing oak from different specific places because you know, you're very sort of looking at local? What's your approach to the oak on that? Uh, so our barrels come from Kelvin Cooperage. They are a cooperage in Louisville, Kentucky, located about 30 minutes to the west of our distillery. Uh, they do, they char the barrels using the leftover wood from making the barrels mm -hmm. and uh, so it's a wood fired char which we think is really cool because some of like the the bigger cooperages they will do a gas fire char and we think that actually can give a slightly different flavor profile to the char which for bourbon is very important i mean it can't just go into any new oak container it has to be a charred oak container and that's because the char creates this caramelization in the wood that as the whiskey gets pushed into the wood and pulled out uh it creates this beautiful flavor it pulls flavor from the wood into the spirit which is important um i mean i know the barrels when you look what you walk into a barrel warehouse and you you look at a barrel and you're like oh it's just sitting there for four years doing nothing it's always working. There's always something happening. I mean even in the cold where we are right now where it's dropping from 30 degrees Fahrenheit down to zero degrees Fahrenheit and back up to 50 degrees Fahrenheit, you know, I mean, all these temperature changes affect the way the bourbon flows in and out of the wood, even though it looks like it's sitting there to us, it's working every day, every hour, creating these beautiful flavors. And that's why it's important to have that char in the barrel. And are you, um, are your Coopers sourcing from a certain area that like going to the Ozarks or is it, or you don't know where they're sourcing it? I don't know exactly. I know they do pull some of the oak from Missouri, but I'm not 100% sure where they get the wood. I know some of the wood does get aged at their facility in Louisville, um, but I'm not 100% sure where they pull the oak from. Cool. And, and Colby, what about you? Are you kind of looking at where you source your oak? Are you using, are you tempted to use, is, I mean, 
Is there trees in Nevada? I mean, it's all desert, no? Yeah, no. So all of ours come from the same same place as everybody else's does, because yeah, we don't have a lot of oak trees here in Nevada, although it'd be great if we did, but we don't. But what's really great about American oak is it's a little bit spicier than like your French or Hungarian oak. And so um, I studied a lot about wine too. And so that's why in wine, usually you use French oak, even in the United States or Hungarian oak and and stuff because it's a little bit softer. It's a little bit um, more like caramel, vanilla flavors, even more than, than American oak. And when you get wine that has, has it been aged in American oak, normally it's really spicy and, and like really a um, little bit more in your face than, than the really soft um, kind of sweet tones that the, the that French or Hungarian That doesn't sound like oak. America at all. Yeah. <laughs> well, in your face? No. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> so, um, but that's why I love American oak. And then, but actually by, by charring the American oak, you actually make it a little bit softer than it would. Like if you were just toasting it, like a wine barrel is typically just toasted. And so by charring it, it's called the Millard reaction. And that reaction actually changes the physical properties of the wood. And it actually brings out the, the flavors and the, the actual sugars from the wood. And so that really helps um, mellow out the American oak a little bit but um, you really get totally different flavors from different chars of wood. And so our barrels are all char three on the staves and then the head, or I'm sorry, char four on the staves and the heads are char three. And so you get a little bit of those different um, flavors from each level of char and it, it gives a little bit of complexity to the, to the actual whiskey. And, and that's super interesting. You know, it's like in Scotch whiskey, you would toast to different levels to get different things. In wine, you would toast to different levels to get things. That charring just really acts as that sort of filtration system and, and add some really depths of flavors. I think we all probably want to have a little a little dram again. Um, so Jay, can we have a, a look at your two new riffs, the beauties that we have before us, which I, I've just been, I'm literally drinking my way through all of these right now. I think I'm, I might have to leave the car behind today. <laughs> Sure, happily, happily so. So uh, as I was saying about our mash bill in the bourbon, and let's begin with our single barrel bourbon. Uh, this is 30% rye, 65% corn, and 5% malted barley. So a genuinely high rye mash bill. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with rye whiskey and the flavor of what rye grain does in an American whiskey, we're about to find out, uh, powerfully so, when we taste the single barrel rye in a minute. But rye is, is added to bourbon as a flavoring grain, as something to give character to the sweeter and, and somewhat blander uh, uh, corn. Uh, a typical rye percentage historically would be 12 to 15 percent or something. So at 30 percent, we are reaching for a more powerfully flavored uh, bourbon than otherwise. Uh, rye gives off notes of, of spice. Uh, clove is a very common one. We'll taste this again in a few minutes. But what you sh what you hopefully wind up with is is a good, large, full scale, powerful bourbon experience. This is also barrel proof. It's barrel proof without shale filtration. We go into the barrel at 110 proof. And depending on where the barrel sits in the Rick House, it can gain a little bit of proof up to maybe 114. I think the strongest barrel we ever saw was 115. And sometimes it can drop down to uh, 106, 107. I think this bottle I have in front of me is 103.4 proof or 51.7%. The point being, it's very tractable to drink it straight. You don't get from, from a New Riff single barrel 139 and a half proof. You don't get a bourbon that's illegal to bring on an airplane, things like that, that are very, that's cool. It's kind of obstreperous to drink. And especially for, uh, for people who are getting to know American whiskey, maybe it's helpful to, to, to not drink something that could, could uh, get you thrown off the plane. Uh, you can drink your whiskey any way you want. Just buy mine. <laughs> I like to add a tiny bit of water to it, uh, as is very commonly done there in the UK. I often have to explain myself to Americans who are obsessed with drinking it straight up. But in the UK, you, you guys are familiar with adding a little water. So if I add a little water, I don't know if you can see this on the interweb. Yeah, no, I think it's a bit weird because of the back. Try it at home and you can see the oils swimming around in that whiskey that would be filtered out or, or attenuated if we did any chill filtration on this. So hit it with a little water if you like and you will see more and different flavors come out. And the, 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 the spectrum or speaking in a musical context because I'm a musician and we're named New Riff after all, the EQ you never changes, thought, you know? Jay. <laughs> yeah. the, the, the EQ curve you know, can change when you add a little bit of water and more flavors come out, different flavors. Actually, I don't know if you can maybe see easier on mine that 
a little bit more of that oiliness. Yeah. Uh, it's it's hard because I've got lighting that's a bit odd here, but. Mm -hmm. So that is the bourbon and tasting you'll get, there's a creaminess and, and good vanilla and confectionery tones, but very quickly also that, that rye note comes in, the spicinesses, uh, the spices that we get in that. Uh, if we move on to the rye whiskey, shall we, Dawn? Yeah, perfect. The mash bill here is 95% rye, 5% malted rye, and if, if you had any doubt, this is like shifting from, uh, you know, the, uh, the, let me put it in a term you, you, you Britishers can understand. We're getting into the Vindaloo curry now. And it's, it's much spicier. And if you had any doubt about what a, what a spicy Indian curry was like, now you know, having tasted the Vindaloo. So 95% um, rye, there's nothing standing in the way, no corn at all between you and that, that spicy rye flavor. There are notes there of, I mentioned clove, sometimes other hard spices like nutmeg or mace. Um, there I can be a variety of- Get caraway now. I just- Caraway. Oh. Which is super interesting. So guys, I mean, one point that I just always harp on and on and on about, don't be afraid to let your whiskey sit in the glass for a while because this has been sitting in my glass for an hour. And I didn't get those notes when I first picked it up. And now something like caraway, and on the, the, the bourbon, I got this lovely green padron chili pepper note, which I didn't get oh, before. Cool. Let glass breathe. It's super interesting. You're just going to find more. Cool. I, I like that, Don. Yeah, there, there can be a breadiness. It's not there all the time. You, you're, you want to go, well, rye bread. It doesn't mm -hmm. always taste like that, but there can be a grassy element to the rye. And other flavors of, of various colors of peppercorn, pink peppercorn, but black peppercorn or, or Thai long pepper that, I've, that, I, that I have in my cupboard, um, mint. We often, not always, but often there's a, a, a bit of mintiness in our New Riff uh, rye that is not like a peppermint candy, but like spearmint, wintergreen. And sometimes it crosses over, we were talking about this earlier, Dawn, a rooty quality, like, like root beer or licorice root, not licorice like in absinthe, but licorice root. Uh, there can be this rooty quality as well that, that I find uh, pretty alluring. Makes a smashing cocktail, uh, Manhattans and old fashions and things, but I, I promote a use for rye that is pretty overlooked in Kentucky, which is to make a mint and julep. And uh, I don't wait for the horse race to come around to make a rye mint julep. In fact, I drank one a couple nights ago. The mintiness in that rye, I, I think goes smashingly with the mintiness in your sprig of mint that adorns uh, the cocktail. And I mean, it is delicious. We were talking about mint julep earlier, which I just think is delicious, but I love these. And I was saying earlier, you know, I, I think what I think is really interesting about them, there's power, but yet there's this beautiful balance to them, which I, I find really, really interesting. And, and Brian, I'd love to bring you in here because I think it'd be really interesting to compare two sort of rise together because they are just so different. And I think it goes back to that point, you know, this is a Kentucky rye, yours is a Maryland rye. <laughs> yep, that's right. You know, I, I think it's a theme you kind of even heard in the very beginning. Um, I think one of the things that's so great about the community of distillers is, you know, we're not afraid to share knowledge with each other. No one, I think, is afraid of anybody ever coming in and there's stealing big secrets. There's we all want to kind of have our own thumbprint and we all kind of have this regionality to it. And so Maryland style rye, if you will, was always known as a little bit sweeter, more approachable rye. So when we talk about typically the rye spice, um, you know, we definitely have some of that, but what we did, I mentioned earlier that we distilled two different mash bills and we distill one that's 95% rye, 5% malted barley, and we'll age that four to six years. And then we have one where we distill barely legal, 52% rye, 44% corn, 5% malted barley. We age that four to six years. And then every product we have has a blend of those two straight ryes. And what we're looking for is kind of getting that spicy complexity out of that high rye, but then this really beautiful balance of kind of earthy sweet notes um, that we'll get out of the corn that kind of create a really nice, beautifully balanced rye whiskey, if you will. Um, and this particular one, our, our signature rye, we proofed down to 83 proof or 41%, 41.5% ABV, because back in the day, Maryland was usually distilling and bottling at 80 to 86 proof. And so we kind of split the middle there 
Um, we have some big, bold cast strengths and, and a double oak, which we um, do in a toasted wave state barrel. But this one really kind of, for us, really speaks to our understanding of what Maryland rye whiskey may have been back in the 1800s or so. And, and it, you know, you get that on the nose, you even get a little bit of that rye spice, that clove and that nutmeg, but I get a little bit of like citrus almost, you know, a little bit of orange peel. And Absolutely. on the when palate- I picked this up, I was like orange rind. Like, yeah. how straight. It was just this lovely citrus, citrusy, no, almost pink grapefruit to a degree. It has this really, really interesting, and you're right, it's that slightly earthiness that I think makes this one so appealing. It's, it's just that nice balance. It, it, and it's so different. Yeah, that's what's yeah. so amazing. You know, it, it's, it's not cookie cutter in America. Right. Cookie cutter, sorry, anyone. We're past the watershed. No, we're not. Uh <laughs> <laughs> you know, one of those things where I, I, you know, a lot of times people can be intimidated by a big, bold rye. They're, they find it to be maybe angular. Um, and again, so we typically say this is a great place for you to start. You know, for us, this is a really easy drinking, approachable rye whiskey, still complex and full of flavor, even though it's a lower ABV. Like I said, we have the big, bold ones. So if you're newer to rye whiskey, this is a great entry point. Um, still stands up in the, a classic cocktail like a Manhattan old fashioned. Um, and, uh, you know, if you're a very seasoned whiskey drinker, this might be more of a breakfast rye for you. And so, you know, no, and a little bit, a little bit easier on the palate. A breakfast rye. I, can I steal <laughs> that because that is awesome. <laughs> exactly. And and yeah, you know, I, I want to kind of yeah, guys, if you want to throw up any questions, I love the comments. It's super interesting. You know what you're thinking. You know what you're tasting. Always the guys I know for for the distillers. It's always interesting to see what comments you guys have. But you know, I think the one thing that we kind of touched on a little bit and we've kind of, and I'll go back to everyone on this, but, but Brian, I'll start with you is innovation. How do you innovate within something that has laws? And I think people are, um, you know, especially in regions, I'll take rum, for example, who are struggling now to kind of do a, a, a kind of a laws around certain countries like Barbados are working on a GI and things because they're worried that it will stop them innovating. But I think, you know, clearly here, we've seen four very, very different styles of, of whiskey for people that are innovating in their own way, but within a still a, a sort of restriction. And, you know, with bourbon, it has to be new oak, um, American new oak uh, to chard. You're playing around with different barrels, which is in the UK right now, something we're seeing is a bit of a trend. You know, people are playing around with different kind of port finish, you know, wine cask aging. What made you kind of go down that route and, and you know, how are you finding that? Because I'm interested. Um, yeah, you know, it's interesting. Being a young distillery, it's, uh, there's a few things that we feel like we have to do. One, you know, there is an innovation part, but we still have a long ways to go as far as perfecting and, and mastering what we do. And that's why you kind of just see us focusing on one thing is like, we want to get great at one thing. And then you know, distilleries in the early stages, the challenge is, you know, really waiting for your whiskey to get some nice age to it. Um, and then life gets a little bit easier, but you certainly can't force that. You have to be patient. You know, we use 53 gallon barrels and, and you just wait it out and it'll happen when it happens. You know, we see with rye grain, the 95% the rye mash bill, it tends to age or mature a little bit faster in the oak. The corn, not as much, um, needs a little bit more time and, and we can play with those two. And then what the innovative part of that is finding a blend of those two and then finding um, some unique finishing barrels that might complement it. And um, so we've done a wide range. We do two releases a year underneath the Sagamore Reserve Series. And they're, they're limited depending on what kind of barrels we find. And we've, we've done some that are, are basic like um, a rum. Uh, we've done some that are, are, we call the Vintners, which was a blend of, of Cab, Shiraz, and, and Pinot Noir barrels that we finished our whiskey in. Uh, we have one uh, that's coming out this month where we finished in extra Anejo tequila barrels that had tequila in them for 14 years. Really uh, interesting. Beautiful, like peppercorn vanilla. It's really mm -hmm. actually quite beautiful. Uh, one of my favorites is probably, uh, we sourced some cognac barrels that had cognac in them for 30 years and finished in those for about six months. 
And then we were fortunate enough in 2019 to win uh, world's best rye whiskey in San Francisco spirit competition with our one that we finished in port barrels. And so it's, it's really interesting because that, that rye spice, um, it, it really works well a lot of times with fortified wine, but we're now we're seeing in other things like tequila and so forth and, and sherry PX and, and is, is also working well with it at the same time. And then we've had some great collaborations where we're releasing this week where we worked with a local brewery. They aged their imperial stout in our casks for a while. As soon as they dumped them, we drove over, had a beer with them real quick, grabbed them and then drove right back to the distillery and filled them up with a five-year-old whiskey and, and let them sit there for just over a year. And, you know, it's a beautiful cocoa, chocolatey, multi um, rye whiskey. And, and having those two rye mash bills allows us to really play what we want to turn up or turn down. Do we think we need sweeter notes? Do we need spicier notes? And then what are we working with? And we kind of try and find a really nice balance with them. So it's been fun, um, you know, and it just, you know, a little bit of innovation on the side while we, we make sure we continue to focus on the three core products and, and make them as best as humanly possible, focus on quality and consistency on those. Um, I actually have a question for you, Brian. Um, we have a question from Matt saying, um, are the, do you do stronger styles with the higher ABV in your range or do you normally stay at that ABV? No, so our, our so we have a double oak. So after aging our, our whiskey for about five years, we'll put it back into another new American oak barrel that we cut grooves down the lengths of the inside of the staves, creates about 23 to 25% more contact surface between the whiskey and the wood. We toast that barrel and do another 18 months in that and we proofed that one at 43.6% uh, ABV. Um, we have a cast strength, which usually is around 56% ABV. And then we, our Sagamore Reserve Series tends to be uh, usually around 50% ABV. And then our Barrel Select program is 55% ABV. So I've just had one of the longest questions ever so I have put it in the chat function so if any of you want to, want to look at it because um, I'm going to throw it to all of you because it's a question for the whole panel um autumn I'll start with you and actually what I do want to do is say you know kind of to round off the tasting and, and guys please throw in questions if you have them to the crew because we've, we've got a great panel here um so this is the question some folks are predicting that the trend towards the more exotic barrel finishes uh, is approaching a jump the shark moment. Uh, I kind of we have a qualification of what the jump the shark moment is because I'm not 100 percent sure I really understand that, but don't worry. Um, so, <laughs> what do the guest speakers think? Um, and if the emphasis on bar fin barrel finishes may start to decline, which I guess is what the jump the shark is, does the shark eat you? I mean, I'm, I'm just throwing it out there as a question. Um, oh, it's when Fonzie jumped a shark and ruined the program. Oh, okay, sorry. Thanks, thanks, Matt. <laughs> I'm now going to find that episode on Netflix or wherever I can find it and understand the jump the shark. Thank you all for bringing something new into my life that I have never heard of. Um, okay, and so what is the next hot thing? <laughs> Let's go back to that. So autumn, one, barrel finishes, anything you've ever considered doing and two, what do you think is the next hot trend in American whiskey? Which is actually, I love this question. Uh, so we have, we are playing around with some barrel finishes, um, just the idea of doing some. Um, we haven't, we're, they're all just ideas in our head right now. We haven't actually experimented with any of them quite yet. Um, but I, I don't, at least here to me, I don't see it slowing down necessarily quite yet. Maybe it's different over in the UK than it is here in the US. Um, but I don't see that slowing down quite yet. Uh, as far as the- What are you playing around with? What finishes are you playing around with? Uh, well, we're playing around with a possible double oak expression, but again, it's just all in our head right now. Um, we talked about possibly doing like a port finish, maybe uh, a beer finish possibly we just we've got some different ideas that we've thrown around that we just yeah. haven't jumped on quite yet i mean i'm quite voluble about finishes especially wine finishes which is why i'm super interested to try some brands i think the tequila finish idea is very interesting for me actually finishing does not allow and, and this is me because i'm not a distiller i can 
quite say this just because I'm allowed uh, as a buyer to say anything I want. Um, I, I think it's really interesting that it just doesn't give the, the whiskey time to really incorporate the flavors. So I'm quite, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in how people approach them. I think it's about the amount of time that they spend in them. I do think things like beer finishes, and it's probably because I'm a wine snob. So, you know, for me, wine is always a problematic thing. Um, and also I don't think people are using the right wines or wine casks. But yeah, I think, you know, I'm smelling this. Sorry, I just got myself totally off track on that. That's probably because I've drunk half the whiskey in the room right now. Um, but, you know, actually I could see this with a, I'm smelling the, the Jet Creek again and Creed again. And I'm getting the, I could see why it would work with something like maybe like an IPA cask. Jay, you were you were brewer before. I mean, I, I just think it would kind of be quite interesting because that grassiness is coming through for me now. So, okay, that's interesting. You know, and I, so what do you think if we took finishes out, what do you think is the thing America's gonna play with next? Oh, you know, that's actually really, it's a great question, but for me at least it's a difficult one just because everybody's doing something different and the next big thing could be something you would never have expected. Um, like a couple of years ago, that peanut butter whiskey was just everywhere in the stores. And I didn't understand how that could have possibly have been the popular it product of the summer, but it was, nobody would stop talking about it. So <laughs> I, I honestly- our gin, don't ask. Yeah. So I'm honestly not sure what the next big thing is. Everybody's got some, some irons in the fire and they're all doing some pretty cool stuff. So we'll see what takes over. I like it. I like it. Colby, what, what, are you, have you practiced, played around with any barrel finishing and what are you doing over there? We haven't, we haven't done any barrel finishing because what, what we're trying to do is like we want to showcase our grains that we grow on the farm. And so we don't want to mask the flavors that the grains are, are, um, are given off. It's kind of funny though. We, I did do one double oak barrel because we got a ship, we got a shipment of barrels. They're all Frey Ranch branded, you know, and it's funny because I got one that said Wilderness Trail on it. And we said, what are we going to do with this barrel, you know? And so we actually dumped a five-year-old whiskey into it for like our double oak one barrel sample. And it was really ironic because Dr. Pat from Wilderness Trail literally came to the distillery the next week. And we're like, you know, we got this Wilderness Trail barrel. barrel. What are we going to do with it? And, and uh, so we, we got... Dr. Patton said, look, we got this barrel. I bet you've never seen one of these before. And it just never gotten a barrel from any other distillery. It just happened to be this one. And so that's our only, only experience, experience with, um, you know, doing secondary agings or, or um, other barrels. But like I said, we're really trying to focus on the grain. And so like for our innovation, it's our bourbon is 80% of our production. Our, we have a, a, a Bottled in bond, 100% rye whiskey is 15% is of our production. I'm almost halfway through my bottle, Colby. Good. <laughs> so, so that's kind of our 15%. And then 5% of our production, which we say is 95% of our fun. We have 100% wheat, 100% oak, 100% barley, 100% corn, 100% rye, which we already make. And all these fun things, like we did a quad malt where we malted the wheat, rye, barley, and corn in the same ratios as our bourbon. And um, we have uh, smoked malts, like Scotch style single malts. Um, we have, uh, you know, all these different innovations, a, a rye and smoked oat and all these fun things. And so that's kind of where I see like our future going. I don't know about the whole, um, you know, the industry as a whole, but for us, it's really a way to showcase the grains that we're growing. And so we've experimented with like different varieties of oats. So we, we came up with this variety that's called a wholeless oats. It, oats are really a finicky in the distilling, in the distillery because they're 60% holes, which is the, the perfect coating that goes around the, the grain itself. And these holes are a huge nuisance in the distillery. Like, it, you know, wine, when it ferments, the, the bubbles push all the skins to the top. Well, these oat holes push to the top of the fermentation tank. And it was like this muffin of just oat holes on the top of the tank. They were kind of a nuisance in the distillery. And so it's really fun to experiment with these holeless oats, which now gave us the ability to um, you know, make oat whiskey in a more efficient, economical way. And so it's that that's where I see like our future in the, the spirits world going. And, and Matt's asked the question, is anyone doing wheated whiskeys? And there you go, Matt. Yeah. 
you did whiskey 101 at Frey Ranch. So that, that, yeah. that's, that's, that's what I always thought would be really fun is someday instead of doing, we do barrel picks and like we do uh, single barrels, which is barrel proof and everything else. But I always thought we have uh, right now about four years. So we'll release it in a year or two. We have 100% wheat, 100% barley, 100% corn, 100% rye. And I always thought it'd be fun to do store blends where we can send a store a vial of four or five different types of whiskey and say, give us the percentages you want us to blend that whiskey. And you can have your own proprietary uh, store blend. And, and that's kind of where I, I see us going. Next week, yeah? Yeah, yeah. we get your blend. We'll put a little syringe in there and you can put a few milliliters of this and that. And I've always wanted to be a blender. <laughs> I think I'd suck at it, but let's not worry about that. Um, and Jay, actually, I'm going to throw this question from Matt over to you because we touched on it earlier. Um, sorry to keep asking questions. No, Matt, you're, we love questions. Um, what is the view on barrel sizes, quarter cask, for example? And I know, Jay, you touched on this earlier, so I'd love to throw that one on to you. Right. Uh, you know, if I could go back in time a little bit, the one of the the early propellers to to building a distillery were, were some of the distilling conferences that I went to starting in 2008. And uh, that was back on when I was a retailer like you. And I was the only retailer at this distilling conference. And I went to meet some, some distillers. And I remember the, the head of the distilling conference saying, guys, it's these small barrels. That's the ticket. That's how we can turn a profit and not go out of business next year. You know, use small barrels. And there was a, a rush to use small barrels. And I saw that and thought, well, that, that could be cool. In the fullness of time, as I sold these as a retailer and tasted very many of them, I came to not personally not really enjoy the flavor of small barrels. I'm speaking here of perhaps quarter barrels, uh, but barrels down to five gallons, 10 gallons, 15 gallons. A 30 gallon barrel doesn't, uh, doesn't suck that bad in my opinion. <laughs> But a lot of distillers were using these very small barrels and putting things out to market very quickly. Now, who am I to say that we shouldn't use those because fortunes have been made on these small barrels. I mean, people have executed a distillery plan and sold it off to a major company, possibly one located in Britain, and <laughs> it, and it succeeded and it like they pulled it off. And the, the distillery, distilling conference guys, they were, they were right, it did work, but I don't like it personally. New Riff was, was certainly always going to only age in 53 gallon uh, barrels. And I see more and more people retreating from the small barrels um, as I see more and more consumers absolutely hating them finally. And it kind of coming to the point that, that I did personally in my, my own palate. Um, so um, uh, more and more uh, as the American distilling industry, uh, pardon the pun, but matures, there were more people saying, you know, we got to put these in big barrels and we have to wait and there's no other way. And as everything matures and, and maybe uh, better financing comes into the picture as well, more and more people are able to do that. So personally, I'm not a huge fan of them. Um, there have been some cool uh, quarter cask uh, finished expressions out of scotch. I'm not sure why, but when I taste uh, a, a peated Isla whiskey with a quarter port cask, it doesn't seem at all as obnoxious as uh, a, a very small American quarter barrel. Maybe our, maybe our quarter barrels are smaller than yours, but in America, we also went for new charred oak barrels so that you could sell a bourbon in a year and it would have a nice dark color and a lot of oaky flavor. But what it lacked in my opinion was, you touched on it earlier, Don, the maturation, the time in the barrel that it takes to knit those alcohols and those esters and the, and the oxygen together in esterification. And that is missing in those small barrels. And it's what I, I finally decided not to like about them. So uh, that, that's where we stand on it. But if you want to start a distillery and, and uh, put them in small barrels, knock yourself out. It just might work. And I think the next person that sends me a product they tell me is really identical. It's a, it's a fast aged product that is so fabulous. It tastes identical. I am literally going to tell them to shove it up their asses because it just doesn't taste any thing like a properly made and aged product. Sorry, I shouldn't say things like that out loud, but hey, that's what I'm about. Brian, <laughs> before I say something I regret, what do, what do you sort of think about that cask question? And actually then I have another really, guys, you're sending some awesome questions through, I love it. Um, but yeah, I've got another pretty interesting question to ask. 
No, I, I tend to agree with uh, Jay. I think um, the small barrel trend had its time, um, but I, th I think it's behind us now. I think what's really exciting about, you know, the, the amount of small distillers in this country it is, I think you're going to start seeing some really impressive products. Mm -hmm. Not that we don't already have a lot of them out there, but I think it's just going to continue to grow as we see a lot of, a lot of whiskey getting some age behind it. Um, so we've got some really exciting days ahead of us uh, from a lot of different distilleries. And, and so I think, I, I think it's just, it's just getting started really. Yeah, I a hundred percent agree. And the, the quality of the product I'm tasting now, and even from the big boys, actually, I, I you know, we're talking to four small distillers, but even the big boys are really some of the liquid that I'm tasting now. Fantastic. Four roses. Honestly, great value for money. Yeah. So I think, you know, we, we're seeing a real quality step up for me in, in American whiskey, full stop. So actually, Brian, I'll ask you this and then I'll ping this to everyone. So Randall's asking, how are your flavors picked and what experimentation do you do to decide like how you get those flavors? Is it a cultural direction? I think Brian's quite an interesting one for you in thinking about the historic history of, of Maryland and, and rye. Or is it kind of based on sort of tasting and what you feel is right for the thing? So where is flavor coming from and how you, how do you figure out what flavors you want, I guess, is the question. Yeah, I, I, it's a great question. I mean, obviously, um, as pretty as the stills are, you know, 50, I, I kind of view basically 50% of the flavor is going to come from fermentation and 50% is going to come from the barrel. And at the end of the day, you know, we are specifically chasing uh, a specific type of flavor, if you will. And how do we continually find a balance of saying, wow, that's, um, that's, that's got some nice rye spice, uh, but it also has this beautiful balance again. And so like, we like the idea of, of, of kind of the combination of, of rye spice with a sweet fruity floralness. And that's really what we look for um, in everything that we do. And a lot of times in a blind tasting, it's not uncommon for one of our products to come up as, as someone thinking it's a bourbon. And, you know, we kind of often call it a bourbon's drinker's rye, especially on that double oak one we have, because it picks up so many sweet notes from the, the wave, the toasted barrel. And we use more of the low mash bill on that one. And so we kind of turn up a little bit more of those sweet notes. And so that one's we kind of little have a little fun and kind of throw it out there and in blind tastings, it can throw some, some folks off. But, you know, we really look to this, this one that everyone tried today is just this kind of definition of Maryland style rye. And I think you're going to continue to see as, as like you talked a little bit earlier about trends and the, and the consumers just getting wiser and wiser and wiser. And I think American whiskeys will continue to also trend a little bit in a direction, if you will, similar to, to wines almost with this regionality. Mm -hmm. um, you know, New York Empire rye, uh, Monongahela style, Pennsylvania, uh, you know, Kentucky rye, Maryland style rye, Virginia has things going. I, I think Nevada's got some good things going, you know, obviously, you know, so I think, you know, we've seen some good stuff up in Minnesota. Um, and I think people will really kind of start paying attention to that. And I think it's going to be really exciting to see that. And each one is kind of looking for, you know, something that's really great quality, but you know, you're going to have these distinctive kind of tasting notes. It's, it's, it's kind of no different than you can tell the difference between a, a Brown Foreman product and a Jim Beam product by sipping, you know? Um, and I think you start seeing these regionalities play out because we are specifically looking for uh, a taste profile. Um, and I think people say like, wow, that's a lot of times with our cash drink, people are really caught off guard. The fact that it's 56% ABV, it doesn't necessarily drink like that. It's, it's big, it's bold, but it's at the same time, dangerously easy to drink for a high ABV. And I think that's a really interesting point because I think what people forget about America, America is a huge country and the climates are very, very, very different wherever you go. You know, you go down to Texas, that is not the same as Maryland. It's not the same as Nevada. And climate does, as we talked about earlier, when we we're talking about kind of the barrels and how they're kind of moving in and out and taking on different flavors and things, all of that is going to affect flavor. And, and I think that's a really interesting point is that how are those regional differences going to emerge, this idea of terroir and as a as a wine person spirits can't you know uh, 
go on if I say. Taking that terroir of place and people and culture, which Randall, I think, is definitely where you're kind of coming from. Now, I am very, very conscious of these amazing people's time that I have been taking up for quite some time now. And so if any of you guys have any last questions, we have actually one question coming from Facebook saying, will we ever see a peat smoky finish from any of you guys? I think Jay touched on it earlier. Yep, Brian, you're... We had some Lafroy barrels and we finished in them. And uh, yeah, it was really interesting. Autumn? And, uh, there's two retailers with that. Pardon me? No, I just said, Autumn, do you, you, you looked like you had a little twinkle in your eye there. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm sorry, it reminded me. Um, so we played around with our corn one year because my, my dad, he, he, he loves playing around with different mash bills and different ideas. He's actually got his own little still here in, in the distillery. It's a little 30 gallon pot still. And that's his, his little baby that he likes to play around with different ideas on. And one that he came up with is he wanted to try to take our corn, smoke it for 24 hours, and then distill it. It did not come out very good at all. <laughs> it came off the still. It was the first thing he'd ever distilled where it came off and he immediately turned the still off and went, nope, that was a bad idea. <laughs> it was just, it... It was one of those things where it, we have a shelf when we did distillery tours, I mean, COVID kind of put a stop to that for a little bit, but we had a shelf because we do so many different experimentations. It's the bless your heart shelf where we put the failed experiments <laughs> up for people to be able to smell Brilliant. if they want to, they can taste. And that corn one was the shining star of the bless your heart shelf. I, I think that's brilliant. And I love the fact that you're heroing the failures as much as success, because I think that's just absolutely brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. So I am going to close out the tasting because I am seeing Colby wants to go drive that damn tractor. I'm, I'm having fun. Yeah. <laughs> you're like, no, and all of you guys have been absolutely amazing um, tonight. But, you know, if you were going to sum up in one word, or not one word, if you were going to sum up in a sentence where you think America will be in five years time, Colby, where do you think America will be in five years time? You know, I think there's a big trend overall in, in America at least, but I think everywhere in caring more where your food comes from and about how it's produced and everything else. And that's why it's, um, I'm really glad that, um, you know, Brad, Jay and Autumn are great examples of this as well as I hope us and, and to be really transparent but also um, focusing on quality over quantity and also, um, you know, sustainable ways and everything else. And so I really think there'll be a trend in that, a trend in that overall to continue on. I mean, it's, it's already started, but um, really knowing where your food comes from and being transparent, I think is, is going to be a big focus in the distilling world. No, absolutely. Jay? Well, as much as I would like to say that, that uh, American whiskey should continue to be all Kentucky all the time. Uh, I think what we will continue to see is that America is a, a country, and this is very different from, for example, my beloved Scotland and the single malt scotches that actually are behind me here in my office. Um, there is um, the, the Scotch Whiskey Association, for example, some people think is being uh, inhibitory to um, innovation and new directions and new things and making a uh, I think there are some distillers in, in Scotland making rye whiskey, and I'm not even sure they can call it rye whiskey. I, I could be wrong on that. The point being, uh, America has a tremendous breadth of whiskey styles. Um, all of us here make more or less Kentucky-derived thing. Colby's whiskey's made with uh, those kind of... Colby's not trying to make scotch. He's not making, you know, single malt, my version of Macallan or something like that. We are here playing in a, in a field that is relatively... Kentucky derived, but there's so much innovation and so many different wide open possibilities for where American whiskey can go. And I think while Kentucky will continue to lead certainly in, in volume and there's lots of great stuff here in Kentucky, y'all come back now and see us, uh, the, the breadth and depth of what America offers to the world whiskey drinker is that you can come to American whiskey and find almost anything. It's, it's not just the, the narrower yet beautiful confines of for example, Irish whiskey, which I adore also. I don't see Irish whiskey being made with 100% with wheat, you know, things like that. So um, we, have a, we have a playground here in America 
for whiskey drinkers to come to and, and enjoy. And I think that will that trend will continue. And I'm pleased to see, as I said earlier, our, our industry here mature and become a little more grown up, which I think it needed to do. I think you're you're 100 percent right, and I definitely see that that emerging now, and I'm that's why I am so freaking excited about America right now. Brian, what, what's your prediction? Um, uh, it'll taste even better. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> that's brilliant. Yeah. Order, you you lead us out. What, where do you want to see America in five years' time? Uh, well, I agree with Colby about how people are going to care more about what's going in their spirits. I mean, the reason we have the word creed in our brand name is a promise to our customers about what's going into their spirits and being authentic and honest about it. Uh, but the other thing that I see just from a marketing standpoint, you know, as our director of sales and marketing um, is just the amount of growth American whiskey and bourbon have as far as markets out globally here in America, sometimes it feels like we're just being inundated with so much bourbon, but it's really not that much when you consider on a global scale of things, how much more we have to grow and, and expand into. And I, I see a, a more of like a globalization just from a distribution standpoint of American whiskeys around the world, which I'm really excited for. Uh, so that's where I kind of see the future coming from in the next 10, 15 years is just the growth of American whiskeys outside of America. And I think that's such a nice way to end. And I just want to say an absolutely massive thank you to these guys. I mean, I, I, we're seeing some great comments here to say thank you and how much people are learning. And, you know, and I think this is definitely where we start to make America great again. Thank you guys, <laughs> you are wonderful. I really, really appreciate everything you've done tonight. Uh, David, let's take us off Facebook. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. Fantastic.